we have started this new series, Know Why. And the, the essence of the series, if you're coming for the first time, is that is it, it is our ambition, our aspiration, that we would dive into scriptures throughout the summer, read all four Gospels together as a community. There's a reading plan, by the way, if you want to go on Facebook or just ask anybody, we'll connect you to the reading plan, which means as a community, we can read one chapter a day and read through all the Gospels through the summer and even see each other's comments and insights. So it's really good to do it together, right? Um, so the idea is, is, is for us to extract something from this summer and reading scriptures in depth is to understand the very, at the very depth, at the very core, why we want to follow Jesus exactly, right? It's not a religion. It's not a, 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 you know, a feel-good, self-help situation. It's not even about, honestly, it's not, bottom line, it's not about even the relationships, the relationships, the love, the encouragement, the changed lives. All of those things are byproducts of the main thing, and the main thing is that we follow Jesus. And if that's going to be the case, we need to understand why we're doing this, because it's going to be challenged, attacked, questioned, throughout your life, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go through a, a few sort of the, our reading plan for this last week was, I think, chapter 8 to chapter 14. And it is, you know, basically what we're doing, we, we're covering a little bit on Sunday, a little bit on, on uh, during midweek, but it's absolutely impossible to cover eight chapters of the scriptures in any, any given, um, any given uh, meeting because it's, it's, what it is, it's an, it's, an es, it's an essential tale, right, um, the Gospels are, of all of the things that Jesus did. And, you know, in the fourth Gospel, in the, in the book of John, John even says, if we are to tell all of the stories of, of what happened, no books in the, n n not the whole, the, the full world full of books is going to actually unpack that, because there's so much, right? So the Gospels are the essence of the essence. It's people telling the stories, eyewitnesses, over and over and over again, and then at some point saying, we need to sit down and write this down, right? And they did. So because of that, uh, it is sort of the extract, and it's, uh, it's so packed with meaning and power that it's impossible to unpack every, every, every verse of every chapter. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort of selectively uh, pick some themes, and that will be essentially to whet your appetite so you can really read on your own. Um, so today, what I was going to do is I want to share three, three different sort of insights that are connected one with the other I th I, f from the middle there from chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10. Um, the first one is basically about this gentleman um, who approached Jesus. And this is not an ordinary guy. Remember that Jesus was a Jewish teacher, a rabbi, and in, in, during this whole time that he taught, he never left the country. Right? Most of the people that were following him were Hebrew. They were Jewish. As a matter of fact, uh, Israel was under occupation of the Roman powers at the time. So it was a very, very tense political situation. I would even suggest that it's probably way more tense than we ima imagine because the tension that we have here locally doesn't even compare to the tension that they had there. Right? They were under military occupation. So this one time, Jesus is in a, city, in a town called uh, Capernaum, and he's walking down a road, and somebody approaches him. And it's not just somebody. It's actually an officer, a military officer. He's a captain of the Roman army. This is a guy who was the enemy. Right? He approaches Jesus. And it's, uh, I love this insight because... Those of us here who have served in the military or, or somebody who is watching know this. The military does not work without obedience, without chain of command. Can I get an amen, amen from anyone who served? Okay, that's true. Even, though, even, of the, even of those of us who didn't serve, we know that much, right? Like chain of command is everything. It's really, really important. So the insight that Jesus brings out of a conversation with this guy, it's pretty amazing because he's talking to essentially an officer of an, of an occupying army. And here's what it says. So he, he, the, the captain approaches him and he says, my servant is sick. Will you come and heal him? And Jesus says, yeah, I'll go. And here's what the guy says. Oh, no, said the captain. I don't want to put you to all the trouble. Just give me the order and my servant will be fine. I'm a man who takes orders and gives orders. I tell one soldier, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. To my slave, do this, and he does it. Taken aback, Jesus 
said, I've yet to come across this kind of simple trust in Israel. The very people who are supposed to know all about God and how he works. This man, the enemy, is the vanguard of many outsiders who will soon be coming from all directions, streaming in from the east, pouring in from the west, sitting down at God's kingdom banquet alongside Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then those who grew up in the faith, quote unquote, but had no faith will find themselves out in the cold, outsiders to a, to a grace and wondering what happened. Then Jesus turned to the captain and said, go, what you believed could happen has happened. At that moment, his servant became well. So this is, a, this is a powerful story, right? And Jesus picks somebody who is unlikely to be sort of elevated as an example to others. And he says, this guy has more faith than you guys. And this is why he has a simple faith. He has a simple faith that Jesus is Lord and he can command and things will happen, right? Here's another story. Uh, this story is, is Jesus and the disciples. They're, they come from one place. This, they get in a boat. They're crossing um, uh, the sea. And there's a big storm. And Jesus, you know, it, you know famously fall, falls asleep during a storm. Because he's not really worried about anything. Because he commands everything. And the guys around him, they freak out. So here's what happens. Jesus reprimanded them. This is Matthew 8, 26. Why are you such cowards, such faint hearts? Then he stood up and told the wind to be silent, the sea to be quiet. Silence. And the sea became smooth as glass. The men rubbed their eyes, astonished. What's going on here? Wind and sea come to heal once again at his command. Right? So what, he, what we're seeing here is, is, is this contrast that he's making between people who grew up in the faith People who know these, these insiders who have complicated faith, right? And we'll talk about it in a second. And somebody who is an outsider, who has simple faith. And he says, this is a preview of what's, a, what's, a, what, what's about to happen all over. This guy is on the vanguard, this captain, this enemy, this officer. He understands what orders mean if somebody is an actual authority and he believes that Jesus is an actual authority and he basically expects Jesus to give an order and for the order to be obeyed. And then his very disciples who follow him around and see miracles and see him teach, they're in a storm and they have no trust that Jesus can actually keep them safe. You see there? So here's, here's um, the point of simple faith, right? Why... Do we follow Jesus? Because we, he wants us to have simple faith. Simple, simple faith. Simple trust. And the logic is this. See if you can find your, locate yourself in this logic, right? Are you, an outs are you a, a person who has simple tr a trust in God and simple faith? Or are you somebody who overcomplicates things? The logic of a religious person is this. You overthink, you know too much, you overanalyze. What happens that leads to self-reliant religiosity, right? You've been around for 10 years. You've read the Bible a thousand times. You've seen scenarios play, to, play, play themselves out. And what you do is you end up no, thinking that you know about God more than you actually do. And then you overthink, you overanalyze, overstrategize. That leads you to be very self-reliant. And if you're self-reliant, you're not going to get a, a lot of miracles because you're not relying on God. And because you not get a lot of miracles, you don't gonna, you're not going to witness the power of God as much. You're going to have more self-reliance. And because you're going to have more self-reliance, you're going to see fewer miracles. And that's how religious stagnation happens. This is for those of us who have been around for a while. This is for those of us who have actually grown up in the church. It's sort of the same thing. You have that same struggle, that same weakness. Here's the logic of simple trust. Are you ready? Maybe you can place yourself here as well. If Jesus is king and you really, really believe in that, he knows better than I what needs to happen. He knows me better than I know myself. And he can command anything to happen 
including the storm that's around that's raging around me whatever that is it could be economic financial financial emotional relational health storm oh, name the storm he can command that so we'll, what i will simply do is ask and submit to the outcome that is simple trust right Simple trust is basically looking at, at God and having a relationship with God and basically saying, look, when I pray, I will ask what I need. I will ask what I want, whether it's the best thing for me or not. And then there's three options as an outcome. There's a yes answer, a no, no answer, and a not yet answer. And I will accept either of those three with a glad heart. That is simple trust. Don't you think our life would be simpler, happier, and more joyful if we practice that? If we don't overthink, we don't overanalyze, we just go, God, here's my situation. Here's how I feel about it. Here's what I think the outcome should be. I'll leave it up at your throne. And I will expect a yes or no, not now. And whatever comes, that's what it comes. I can't tell you how many, how many times I've seen this play out. Right? How many times... I've seen brothers and sisters who inspire me have that simple trust. You know, we, we've been talking about this. We had this communication with Zach Scott Theater. The, the, we realized that they say, hey, we're going to have this masking thing until later. We're going to announce when that's going to, I mean, they have the, ch the choice as a business. But that reminded me that Zach, Zach Scott Theater was, was, was a, uh, when we got into this, was a, an act of simple trust. Right? We we're about to, to plan tribe. Uh, we didn't even have the budget to actually rent anything. And we were on a tour with our daughter here. And, uh, and, and, and we were, you know, before that, we were like, well, we need to plant this, this tribe thing. Uh, we need a location. And all we did is just pray. We don't know where it's going to be. We probably don't have the money for it anyway. But we're going to pray. This, w this lasted literally, oh, I don't know, three, four weeks. It was that quick. And then we're here. We, you know, they show us this location. I go, I like lose my mind. I go, this is perfect for us, right? Of course, we were tiny. And um, so I reach out to them and say, hey, you guys, um, you guys rent this by chance? They go, actually, yeah, we have a church meeting here. I go, yeah, well, probably couldn't afford it anyway. Okay. Um, here's my card. Um, I think it's probably less than a week later they called and said, hey, the church that was meeting here sort of disbanded for whatever reason. Do you still want it? I said, yes, absolutely. Of course, in the back of my mind going, I don't know where the money is going to come from. You know? Um, and we go to the board. We figure it out. They, they asked us for way less money than way under market, by the way. You know? And this is a beautiful location in downtown Austin. And we have been meeting in Zach for, um, what, eight years now. Eight years now. I can, tell you, I can tell you story after story after story of where simple trusts bring amazing things. You don't stress out. You're not anxious. You just trust God. Okay? So how do I get, the question is, how do I get the simple trust? It's going to be this little sequence, right, from, from Scripture. How do I get this? Because it's, it's easier said than done, right? How do I get this simple trust? There was a shooting yesterday. And... Uh, and I actually found out from another country that there was a shooting in Austin, which, you know, the power of the internet. Um, are you guys okay? Uh, I think so. What, what happened? You know, I didn't know there was a shooting. Well, my oldest daughter, she works in the weekends in downtown. And I couldn't, I, we couldn't get in touch with her, with her uh, until like probably one. And it's pretty, you know, if you're a parent, you know, you... You know how anxiety-inducing that can be. You know, and I'm, I'm just texting her, texting her boyfriend, calling, leaving voicemails. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? There were 14 people shot in downtown Austin. And at the end of the day, as a parent, this is a practical thing, right? Is you have to just choose to trust God. You have no control over the outcome. We're doing other things. There was a baptism, all of that. And all this, this time, I don't know where my daughter is. You know, finally, she t gets, back, back, gets back to us with this long text. But she goes, yeah, we're totally fine. 
uh, he, she was a block away from the shooting. And, uh, you know, and her, heard the whole thing and saw the police and the whole commotion. But what I'm saying to you is that there's so many things in our lives that we have zero control over. And we, if we have, if we develop the simple trust, it changes all kinds of things on a very, very practical level. So how do you get to that? You need to know why Jesus calls outsiders. And, you know, it's sort of mysterious to you maybe, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you in a second what that means. There's this interdependence between what Jesus wants us to do, right? He wants us to develop simple trust. That's connected to this other thing. He wants us to know why he brings outsiders into the kingdom. There's a story in Matthew 9. And of course, the, back, the, the context is that he's telling the story about himself. This is Matthew writing the gospel, the account. And he's basically saying, this is how I got in. And it's just a couple of verses. He doesn't make a big deal of it, but it's a big, big deal. He says, passing along, Jesus saw a man at his work collecting taxes. Collecting taxes was basically the bottom of the barrel. This is what you, you're, you're a traitor of the nation if you're a tax collector in Israel because you're collecting taxes for a foreign power, for Rome. He was a tax collector. His name was Matthew. And Jesus said, come along with me. Matthew stood up and followed him. Later when Jesus was eating supper at Matthew's house, so he went from, hey, you, the, the, the despicable tax collector in a booth that is being guarded by a couple of Roman legionnaires so that no one, you know, hurts you. Get up. First of all, leave your very, very high-paying job because they compensated them well to do this, the work of a trader. And follow me. And the next thing you know, Jesus is having dinner at your house. And that just blows people away. And this is what it says. It says, when later Jesus was even eating supper at Matthew's house with his close followers, a lot of disreputable characters came and joined them. <laughs> and when the Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company, they had a fit and lit into Jesus' followers. What kind of example is this from your teacher acting cozy with crooks and riffraff? And Jesus, overhearing, shot back. He says, when, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Go figure out what the scripture means. I'm after mercy, not religion. I'm here. Think about this. To invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. Jesus is here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. So he's sending this message. Very consistently, remember when he talked about outsiders and insiders with the, with the captain or the guard? He's saying the same thing here, only with another story. There was a bunch of disreputable characters hanging around Jesus. That made them very, very, very different from any other teacher. All the other teachers gathered the best of the best, the elite. You know, if you are good enough, you can follow that rabbi or this rabbi. With Jesus... If you are a disreputable character, you are the favorite person for Jesus, right? And here's why this is incredibly important for all of us, especially those who, of us who grew up in the faith or grew up uh, around church or, grew, or, or, or kingdom kids, what we'll call them, right? It's this. Here's the logic of an insider. The logic, the starting logic of an insider is this. I am a good person. I deserve to be here. Therefore, I'm entitled to blessings. I know God. Me and God are cool. Then, after that, what you, what you encounter shockingly is suffering. Shockingly, I say that sarcastically. Because no one's immune. And then you start thinking, I don't deserve this suffering. Where is God? And then it brings you to a, a, a full circle to... I won't really obey God unless dot, 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 I get my way. It's the cycle of entitlement that happens if you're an insider. And that's what's happening here. You become an insider. You start judging people. You think you're better than everybody else. And when the disreputable, char disreputable characters, tax collectors, Roman legionnaires show up in the kingdom in gratitude... You go, what? 
And that's a, a great example of when you've missed the boat. You've literally missed the boat. Here's an outsider's logic. Can I explain to you what the difference is? And maybe you can choose and pick for yourself, even if you've been around for a long time, who you want to be. The outsider's logic is this. I am a disreputable character. That's the starting point. I have shame. I have regrets. I have sins. I'm broken. I've, t I've taken the wrong turn so many times. I've lost count. I'm still working on myself. But man, I don't deserve to be here. So Jesus comes, and in spite of all these things, he saves me, he accepts me, he teaches me, he heals me. And then out of that comes a life where everything that you get that is different, that is transformative, that is better, is an act of mercy, undeserved, a gift from God, right? And then what happens as a full cycle is this, I will do whatever. I'll be grateful every day of my life. I will serve others. If suffering comes my way, I'll take it because I'm no better than anybody else. That is the life of an outsider who, became an, in, who came into the kingdom, into the banquet hall of Jesus. See, mercy is activated by a realization that whatever, however trained, experienced, second, third, fourth generation Christian you are, in the eyes of God, compared to the holiness of God and perfection of Jesus, you are an outsider. You deserve nothing. And that makes him glorious because he will take you anyway. And he will accept you and train you and clean you up and change you and transform you. So even if you've been around for long, be an outsider. Find that heart of an outsider. It's not easy, right? But that's, that's what activates mercy. There's a, um, we've, we, we did a wedding yesterday. I'll talk about it in a second. But um, we're coming from Brass Drop. And Deb, you know, when we go on longer sort of rides, we, Deb and I take turns showing each other music we like. So Deb has been on a, on a, on a long kick of, of, of country music. So she has a playlist. And she plays me this, all these songs. And I'm not a country person necessarily, but I really like the storytelling. So she enlightens me. She, and she has this song uh, that she goes, this is a song about you. And, uh, and, and it's a song that the title is, He's One of the Good Ones. And it's this woman saying, about his, her man, why he's awesome. And all these things, you know, it just piles up praise. And like, I've seen a few bad ones, but this is one of the good ones. And I'm keeping him, you know, something like that. Check it out, actually, a great song. Um, and, it's, and, and when she plays the song, she like touches my hand and she goes, that's you. And the thing that humbles me and inspires me in this very simple thing, right, is that... She's right. I am one of the good ones for her. I've loved her for 21 years, adored her for 21 years, have been faithful, served her. We raised our kids together. It was an mar amazing marriage. But I know this very, very, very clearly, that the only reason why that is true is because of Jesus. I'm a disreputable character. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. I'm sitting at a banquet of my marriage, a godly marriage, only because Jesus let me in. That's it. And that shift in understanding that I'm a disreputable character that gets to party with Jesus changes everything. It, it can fuel your life daily with a sense of gratitude and wholeheartedness, right? That's the difference, and that's what he wants from us. So how do I get an outsider's heart? The next question, right? How do I get that? How do I get that, that sense of gratitude? Can you imagine that, that, that dinner at Matthew's house? Can you imagine how amazing that was, right? All these people that everybody despised, 
are welcomed by the guy, the Messiah, the man. And they're hanging out together. I mean, can you imagine the sense, the energy of grace and mercy and joy that flowed there? That's what Jesus wants for us as a community. You know, one of the things that we do when we help each other become a Christian is that we sit down and do personal Bible studies with each other. Like in this church, some, one, one of the members of the church, so if you're new and you want to find out how to do this, just turn to someone who brought you here and say, hey, can I study the Bible with you? And they'll say yes, which in itself is actually amazing. If they say no, they probably don't, are not members of the church. Seriously. We sit down one-on-one -on -one and we talk about real life, real Bible stuff. And one of my favorite parts in, in the Bible study series that we call the Discovery Study is when we share the disreputable character thing. You know, it's called the sin study. We say, okay, this is what sin is. We'll come up with a list. And then we get to say, look, this is my sin biography. You know, and anybody who I study the Bible with, I just share all of my dirt. It's, I mean, sometimes it's like a complete stranger, right? It's very counterintuitive. But I'll tell you what it also, what it also is. It's liberating. When you just remind, I've, been, I've been in the church for 25 years. I forget how much of a disreputable character I am until I actually say, tell the story once again. And when I tell the story once again, it just blows me away. I'm not only helping someone else understand that they're an outsider, but I'm reminding myself that I'm an outsider. And us as a community, I think we should... We should sort of liberate ourselves from fronting, from putting a mask on, from trying to look good when you're not. We should find that it should be a cultural norm for us to be outsiders. We need to hang out together as a bunch of disreputable characters all the time, even if we've been around for, for, for a long time, right? It's beautiful. It's liberating. You don't have to, you don't have to put up appearances. Wouldn't that be amazing? Would that be a transformative thing? Can you, can you imagine how much more fun that dinner was than a dinner at the Pharisee's house? Like if you ask somebody and as anybody, anybody else goes, hey, would you rather be at this party or that party? It would be self-evident. People go, I'll go with the, with the disreputable characters any day. Right? That's how we are. That's who we are. Even if we're in the church. So here's the question. How do I get that heart? Well, you get that heart by witnessing the power, by being a disciple maker. And we'll unpack that in a second as well. Matthew 9. Matthew 9, verses 36 to 38, and then the beginning of chapter 10. Jesus looks at, over at the crowds, and his heart breaks. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. What a huge harvest, he said to his disciples. How few workers. On your knees and pray for harvest hands. The prayer was so, no longer prayed when it was answered. Jesus called 12 of his followers and sent them into the ripe fields. He gave them power to kick out the evil spirits and to tenderly care for the, care for the bruised and the hurt lives. So Jesus makes this. Jesus basically looks at the crowds and says, there's so many lives that need to be changed here. And so few people to help them change those lives. Right? If you look around in our city of just over a million people. Tell, tell me something. Would it be healthier for you and more inspiring for you to look at the needs and meet those needs or to navel gaze inside a, a little tiny community of 150 people and go, we should do this better and that better? What would be more inspiring to you? And what happens is, especially during COVID, there was a lot of navel gazing in the church in general, but in this church in particular as well. And one of the things that was hard for me emotionally it was to be sort of you know you try to take care of people right answer questions ease their pain all of those things but then part of a big part of me was like there's a city full of hurting people and here we are discussing minor things about masking policy 
ad nauseum. Is this right? And I think it's not right. And I think that's what Jesus is saying here. The harvest is huge. The harvest is huge. The city is full of people who need Jesus. And the question for me and the question for you and the question that he's asking there to the to this followers is like, will you be a harvest hand? Will you lend your hand to the harvest that is huge? There's just few workers on the harvest field. And how if you, if you ask me, how do you get that that heart of simple faith, that heart of being an outsider who doesn't deserve to be here, but gets to be here. It's by doing what Jesus asks you to do and be, being on the harvest and being one of those hands. That's how you do it. And I'll explain to you in a second how that works. By show of hands, if you've been a, if you've been a, a Christian, a disciple, a follower of Jesus for, you know, for any, 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 um, any period of time, did you do it by just praying and reading a Bible? Or do you have people invest in you? Raise your hand if you have people invest in you. Okay, like lower your hand if it's like just one person that invested you and nobody else. How about two? How about three? How about five? Many people. Many people. It just doesn't work any other way according to God's plan. He needs harvest hands. Can he do it alone? Yes. He commands the wind. He can do it alone. But he chooses you to be the harvest hand. He wants you to be the harvest hand. And he calls our attention to the harvest that is plentiful. Right? We, we had a wedding yesterday. Eunice and Naya got, got married. In Bastrop. And Naya and Eunice are amazing. They're, they're, they're both uh, became Christians in tribe, you know. And I, I, did the, I did the wedding. I did it in Spanish and English because, you know, Eunice's family is all Spanish speaking, right? Uh, and uh, it was really cool to see sort of the culture change, right? And it was so powerful because it was, it was a, you know, tons of people. A Texas wedding, very hot, outdoors. All of us were dripping with sweat, right? And all of us were standing, we're there anyway. And the reason why, every, why not a lot of people skipped that, I'm sure it's because they were invested in Naya and Eunice. And I followed their, their journey, you know, we've, many of us have followed their journey. And I can tell you something. They wouldn't have been Naya and Eunice, the ones that we saw and, and, and blessed into, into a new life, if it wasn't for discipleship. If it wasn't for people investing in them for years. That's why it was, that's what made the celebration wonderful. It was not just two people who were like, well, I'll let you know. Hey, I have a girlfriend. Now I have a fiance and I'll invite you. Please celebrate with me. That's one level of celebration. Their level of celebration is Dozens of people invested in him and her separately. They talked to each other. They talked, to, they served alongside in Kids Kingdom, by the way. That's one of their connection points romantically. So, you know, a little plug <laughs> for Tribe Kids. I mean, they literally say one of our first connections was serving together in, in Tribe Kids, right? Um, and then leading a small group together and seeing each other serve and resolve conflict and help somebody. That is how it was built. It's a very, 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 very different romantic story. It's communal. It's profoundly spiritual. It's connected to Jesus, right? And the problem with that, the problem that we have normally in disciple is being a life, having a lifestyle of disciple makers is that we want social acceptance. It's a very primal thing as human beings. We want social acceptance. And disciple making in, in, includes a whole lot of rejection, a lot of emotional labor, right? A lot of heartache, a lot of disappointment because people are fickle and most people will not choose Jesus. That is a guarantee that the, the path is narrow. That's just the nature of things. So you can see the harvest. You can say, I'll be the harvest hand. And you'll see most of the stuff that you're trying to collect as harvest not be a harvest. And it's just painful for, for human beings. It's painful to, 
to, to give your heart and be disappointed. It's painful to be rejected. It's painful to, for people to not accept Jesus. So what we do, the choice is we either do it or we don't do it. We don't do it because we're afraid, because we don't like that kind of pain and discomfort. Because we're self-centered and not other self -centered. Or we do it out of plain and simple obedience to Jesus. Because he knows better why he's asking us to do this. And let's see what, why he's doing that. And before that, I'll tell you what the logic of a spectator of a harvest versus a harvest hand is. The spectator of a harvest, which you may be, I mean, I've been that at times, where you go for a period of time without helping others become Christians, is this. You're like somebody who walks a cooking show and never cooks. You're like someone who does a, does a, you know, a home, home improvement thing and never repairs anything. You're like someone who likes a fishing show and you just watch for hours and you never fish. And the difference is, is that you can enjoy the fishing, you can enjoy the process, but you'll never have ownership. You'll never have that experience of getting your hands dirty and repairing a home. Or failing to do this pastry or that pastry and then getting it right. And having to, uh, somebody say, and that multiplied by infinity. That is the difference of a harvest spectator versus, versus a harvest hand. The church spectator logic is this. You have no skin in the game. You show up at church. You listen to a sermon. You feel better about yourself just a little bit. You sing, you sing some songs. You can tell, to, to, tell other people that you're a church-going, Bible-believing Christian. You get a little status box checked in, right? But you have no re because but you're not on the edge. You don't discover any rejection. You don't do any battle. Therefore, you have no reason really to rely on God and ask for his mercy and his power. And because you have no reason to rely on God and you're not desperate and you're not scared and you have no you're not on the edge and you're not doing battle. And you don't ask God for his intervention. What happens next is that he does not intervene. And because he doesn't intervene, you have even less reason to believe in God. And because you don't witness his power. And you have less trust. And you have lukewarm faith. And you do it over and over again for weeks and weeks and years on end. And you become this very static, stagnant, religious person who witnesses no power of God. And that is the sequence, the logic of a harvest spectator. But Jesus gives you another picture. And here's what he says. He says in Matthew 10, 17, don't be naive. Some people will impugn your motives. Others will smear your reputation just because you believe in me. Don't be upset when they haul you before the civil authorities without knowing them. They're, they've done you and me a favor, giving you a platform for preaching the kingdom news. And don't worry about what you'll say and how you'll say it. The right words will be there. The spirit of your father will supply the words. When people realize it is the living God you're presenting to them, not some idol that makes them feel good, they're going to turn on you. Even people in your own family. There's a great irony here, proclaiming so much love and experiencing so much hate. But don't quit. Don't cave in. It is all well worth it. In the end, don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God who holds your entire life, body and soul in his hands. We had a baptism yesterday. Michael and Anna got baptized. Michael's here. Anna's not here. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and Michael and Anna, the story is just amazing because it started with, um, with Randy Winters playing soccer with, with Michael. He's right there. He's hiding. Uh, also, he's all sweaty. Were you playing soccer? Yeah. Of course. He plays soccer here at Zilker. And they would play soccer for a long time. And then one day, Randy was just moved in the spirit because he saw him, Michael, playing sort of a little bit down. And he, you know, hang Basically, say, hey, can we, can we get coffee? And he shared his faith. And, 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 and the Winters and the Nicelys have been studying with Michael and Anna for, what, six months now? Eight months? Yeah. Some others got involved. You know, we 
went out a couple of times and talked. There's this sort of communal process, right? Um, and, and this is a great example. So these are amazing people who had all kinds of questions, who had all kinds of doubts. And they were in Jesus' list for the harvest. But it's not like they just came to church and said, hey, man, I give myself in. It just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. They needed, Jesus needed harvest hands. And their names were the Winters and the Nicelys and some others to help you guys, correct? Would you, have, would you have arrived at where you have arrived without them? No way. But then was the process easy? No way. Was it, did you make the process easy for them? <laughs> <laughs> you did not, right? Was it frustrating for them at times? <laughs> that's, how, that's what Jesus is talking about. And that's the, that's the thing. It's like we just don't want rejection. We don't want to do the, the emotional labor. What if they did four months and then, you know, Michael and Anna just walk away, which people do all the time. You don't want that. So you don't engage. You don't give. You don't give generously. You're not a harvest hand. You're a spectator. And what you miss by being a spectator is the power of God. So yes, there's a lot of sacrifice. Yes, there's a lot of emotional labor. But then what happens is there's the harvest. And yesterday, we were at this beautiful place on the green belt. And, you know, we're sharing. And, and Randy, if you know Randy a little bit, he's a sort of, he's just like a stoic guy. Like, and Randy lost it. He cried like a little baby, you know? And I, and I was so proud of him, and I, you know, because he was like, I don't know, I can't believe I can't stop crying. And I'll tell you why he couldn't stop crying. It's because this was a harvest hand who knew that the harvest, not, it was not because of him, because of the power of God. That's why he was crying. Was he was crying because he was transformed. You don't get transformed. You don't get to witness the power of God unless you harvest. So here's what Jesus says about this, if you, if you continue. Because we worry about ourselves so much. He says, what's the price of a pet canary? Some loose change, right? And God cares what happens to even, even more than you do. He pays even greater attention to you. Down to the last detail, even numbering the hairs on your head. So don't be intimidated by all this bully talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. Stand up for me against world opinion. And I'll stand up for you before my father in heaven. And if you turn tail and run, do you think I'll cover for you? If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is for, to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. And then he says this. Uh, this is perfect for us to, a motivation for us to be harvest hands. We are intimately linked in this harvest work. Can Jesus do it without us? Yes. He chooses not to. He asks you, this imperfect outsider, disreputable character, to be the harvest hand. And that's the power, right? Anyone who accepts what you do accepts me, the one who sent you. Anyone who accepts what I do accepts my father who sent me. So from all this, all these, this mosaic that we put together, right? All interlinked, but we can see is very simply this, and we'll pray just in a second for 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 the Lord's Supper. Simple trust, just choosing to say, "Look, God is sovereign; Jesus is Lord. I can ask for anything. I should ask for anything because He's my Father, and have, I'm His daughter and His son. And I ask for anything, and the answer could be yes, no, or not now. Is that simple? Therefore." There's no pressure. Just ask and just submit. And that simple truth sensitizes us to how much of an outsider we really are. 
You don't deserve to be in the kingdom. I don't deserve to be in the kingdom. There's no one who deserves to be in the kingdom. The Bible teaches that very, very clearly. So it's much better to consider yourself an outsider, a disreputable character, than to consider yourself that you deserve all of this and be entitled. That robs you of all the grace and the mercy and the power. But also what that does, if you're an outsider who is just partying with Jesus, can you help but be the harvest hand? Can you resist looking at the world through the eyes of Jesus and seeing the harvest is plentiful? There's so many people who need this and I will, I will be the harvest hand. And yes, I will face bullying and rejection and disappointment and disillusionment over and over again. But then those moments come when those who choose Jesus can join the party. And you're there to celebrate. And then you cry like a baby because you can't resist how amazing this whole thing is. Let's pray together.